<laughs> Bobby Corrigan, welcome to Talking Pest Management. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Thank you for having your time. Bobby, first question. Um, how did you experience COVID-19 and what do you think are the impacts on, on rodents? Well, um, I, I think first as an experience, we're all, of course, pretty much in shock that, you know, here in New York City, for example, on March 17th, we were told everybody to go home. You know, and I work in a big uh, office complex in Lower Manhattan, right by the World Trade Center. And um, it, it was like a ghost town within a couple of days. So that was the first thing is uh, a shutdown is, will really wake you up in a big city, of course, when it's hustle and bustle and all of a sudden there's nobody on the street. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as, just as a human, of course, uh, this has really gotten our attention and this has really changed us and it'll be interesting to see how we come out the back end of it. That's going to be what's critical. How many things did we discover already, including here we have a Zoom meeting, for example, that how many do we really need to get on an airplane and travel and stay in hotels and so forth? So I think we're going to learn a lot of things um, as to this COVID-19. So, you know, the pests are also, I think, teaching us some lessons. And, um, you know, I, I think we're observing, um, in my area of expertise, we're observing, of course, rats that woke up and there was no food. Yep. You know, they, they came out and what had been food for decades and maybe hundreds of their generations has gone away. Yep. So now everyone is asking, I'm getting a lot of interview into requests from around the world as to why are the rats acting like they're acting. And, you know, I can say in one sentence, well, deprive yourself of food for three days and see how you feel, see how you act, see how you treat your neighbors. It will be different. 100%. I think a lot of uh, pest control, a lot of what you preach and teach every day is around common sense pest control. So basically thinking about how rodents, um, uh, why do rodents react a certain way? Just looking at how would we humans, who are also just highly developed animals in the end, would react to it. Yes. Um, I'm going to read a quick sentence here and I'm going to ask you for your comment. The USA Today uh, commented that the Center for Disease Control and Prevention is warning that rodent populations which rely on a banquet of scraps and waste in restaurants and dumpsters are spiking in certain areas. Um, you with your focus on NYC, what would be your comment on that? I agree 100% and, and I do, I do uh, collaborate with the CDC on rodent issues and tracking diseases and so forth. So, uh, you know, again, uh, the, the rats, for the most part, as an urban species, you know, the Noe rat and the roof rat, they've become pretty dependent on homo sapiens, mm -hmm. people. And so um, what's happening is the, the animals themselves are not spiking. It's the sightings of the animals that are certainly spiking. Yeah. And, you know, again, when you have a hungry animal that is used to finding its food at night, but all of a sudden... They go out at night and nothing is there. They're going to try the day and see, well, maybe there's something about our cycle that reversed. And you can easily reverse the cycle of pests, especially rats, from day to night, depending yeah. on when you have the food ready. Like so I agree. Here over the past century. Exactly. Totally right. And so the spiking and, you know, is all of a sudden people are seeing some rodents during the day, which is unusual. Some of them are hungry, so they look disoriented. That scares people. They think they're maybe sick and aggressive, and maybe they have rabies, which they do not carry. And maybe they have COVID, they wonder. So yeah. I agree with the statement that the CDC issued. Unfortunately, a little bit, the press is running with certain words to get everyone's attention, like aggressive rats, zombie rats, you know plague ridden rats, they want everybody to read that article. And so they use headlines that are a little bit too sensation, you know, so. Agreed. So what do you think, uh, is it actually, a lot of people also contact me and uh, we discuss in the past world, we discuss whether there is actually just more rat sightings or whether there's actually an increase within the population, especially, especially in, in, in areas like New York City. Well, the interesting thing here is, even though I just mentioned there's more rat sightings, 
my experience as a rodentologist, and I, I'm in contact around the world, including here we have this meeting with you, between you and I in Germany and U.S., but I'm in contact with a lot of pest control agencies. I was just in New Zealand a couple months ago. Um, I think the rat populations in general, as a number, are up. They're up. And business uh, is showing they are up. Requests for services for rats all around the world and mice, by the way, also, we can't exclude them, is up. Mm -hmm. We don't have any strong empirical data, you know, mm -hmm. where we could actually put a before and after, you know, yeah. it's a country by country, city by city. But in general, we do know they're up. The interesting thing is why are they up? That, that's the big that's the $60,000 question, as we say, is uh, why are they up? It's almost like, why did bed bugs return? Yeah. With, with such a vengeance and it's such speed. We don't have the answer for that yet either. True. Yeah, I agree. It would be really helpful to get empirical data. This is also when we are talking about the future of pest management in the next couple of minutes. Um, we're going to discuss also digital helpers. And I hope that empirical data, just data, I mean, you know, the, the FANG companies, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, collect data. And that's the new gold everybody teaches us. I think that in pest yes. management, the new gold will be collected too. But we're going to speak about that later on. I would like to get more into detail again when it comes to all the headlines of, of the big news newspapers and your comment on that people fear that um, rats might also carry COVID. Yes. Uh, everything I've read from the epidemiologists that study which animals are susceptible to COVID-19 um, says the commensal rats and mice are not. I mean, that's certainly good news. Yes. But what is important is, you know, and I did a study with Columbia University School of Public Health here in the U.S., mm -hmm. And we have a very famous uh, virologist, Ian Lipkin, and they have published papers showing rats, our rats in New York City, for example, are carrying a host of novel viruses. And including, they do carry, by the way, I mean, the coronaviruses as a group is a giant group. It's the common mm -hmm. cold belongs in the coronaviruses. Yeah. So they, of course, they're carrying coronaviruses, but not this novel coronavirus, mm -hmm. which has mutated into COVID-19, mm -hmm. not too distant related from SARS, if we remember oh, the yeah. SARS threat. Mm -hmm. So the good news is, and I was one of the ones that asked the question very early on at CDC, is, you know, people are shedding COVID-19 into the sewers, you know, through fecal matter, you know, that you would do that by the billions if you're a carrier. We have rats in our sewers in New York and many of our U.S. cities. And so could they be mechanical transmitters? You know, we're all washing our hands for obvious reasons. Yeah. We're told to scrub beneath the fingernails, so forth and so on, to get rid of viruses that could give you the flu or the cold. Well, what about that connection? And in meetings with CDC, they, they said, well, it's possible but the risk is probably very low for rats to mechanically carry it from the sewers to mm -hmm. services where we would be subject. So that's at least good news. 100%. And I know at least that in Europe, our Association of European Pest Managers, SEPA, is uh, keeping a close eye on this and also supporting uh, university professors and virologists that are looking into that matter, I think, for a good reason, as pest controllers should really uh, play a vital part in uh, um, exploring whether that could be a, da a danger to humanity. Anyways, my next question would be uh, um, oriented on the, on the business uh, side of and uh, perception of pest management. Do you think that pest management companies are only affected that have dealt with bars, restaurants and such, or and hotels, of course, or also uh, the ones that have been focused on commercial properties and uh, food and pharma businesses? You know, I, I, at first, I think the pest management industry was, you know, uh, in a big shock and a big worry. But, of course, pest management here has been, you know, um, labeled as essential services. Yes, I know. And that, that makes the difference of, you know, quote, you're allowed to continue as usual, as best as usual. Of yeah. course, many pest management companies lost the services of some of the restaurants, mm -hmm. but most of the commercial facilities, the restaurants, hotels, you know, shopping malls and so forth, they realize 
you know, even though we're going to be in a shutdown, mm-hmm. if we do not have our essential pest control monitoring and services inspections, you know, all heck will break loose when we open up again 100%. with for pests everywhere. So I think the pest control industry is doing okay. There has been impact, but I think most that had commercial accounts are still servicing those accounts, but in a different way during a shutdown. So you think uh, less service, uh, more reactive as proactive? Um, what could be the approach? That's a great question. I, I think... Um, in some ways, there's more time for the better companies to be proactive yes. and also maybe to take a pause and to think about maybe now is the time to start using remote sensors, for example, yeah. putting in better data management systems. You know, they have a window, I think, to do that because sometimes, you know, everybody says, I will do that soon or I will do that mm-hmm. in the future. And they're so busy just getting the service done, sure, it's hard yeah. to find a window. Yeah. So I'm hoping, <laughs> I'm an optimist along these lines, I'm hoping the better companies realize you have to get on board eventually with remote sensors and data management and dashboards, and that is the future. Why not start now since you have a window? Good argument. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. And also, I am um, an optimist. So let's hope uh, people are going to take the chance and uh, hopefully use that window for a better and for a change. Um, it could definitely, uh, uh, you know, uh, be an important or play an important and vital role in the future of our industry, I'm sure. Um, I would also like uh, to ask you about something that I think we have been speaking about, we as the industry, a lot about, which is IPM, Integrated Pest Management. Uh, you've probably talked about this for ages and, and every other day, but could you again uh, point our view points on uh, why IPM plays such a vital role in pest management and, and, and also your point on whether it is performed um, at a degree that it deserves uh, per today? Sure. You know, You're totally right. I mean, I've been involved uh, with IPM going way back into my early career. I ran a pest control route myself for three years, um, saving money for college. But I have to tell you back then, um, if I did not spray somebody's baseboards with a sprayer, uh, they felt I was cheating them. Yeah. And there's some people that still think that way today. So, yeah. but... I would always remind myself, I was a student, you know, uh, studying some entomology in the background and say, why am I spraying baseboards when the smart thing would be to uh, seal up this building or this house or whatever it might be? Mm-hmm. And so integrated pest management, you know, the foundation is, you know, of course, it's let's keep things clean with sanitation. Let's keep things built up correctly. And then let's monitor and as needed then we institute a control. And I will say, and I, I think it's important when someone asks me about IPM, the word monitoring gets lost. Many times people don't realize if you are not monitoring a pest population you've been hired to manage within IPM, you are not performing IPM. You're leaving out a critical step. And so it's a situation where I try to say, what is your monitoring program? Because sometimes companies will say, we are plugging up holes, yeah. we are stuffing the holes, we are, mm-hmm. you know, trying to clean up. And I said, that's great. What's that's your monitoring. I got it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Where's your monitoring? Yeah. And often that's where the silence, I get a silent answer. So I'm yeah. a firm believer, Danielle, in, in IPM because it, it is sustainable and it mm-hmm. really is a service that will carry itself long into the future, you know, when we perform it. Yeah. In the end, IPM also, as you described, is, is a pyramid um, yeah. with obviously uh, the management of the building, garbage being here, monitoring, uh, physical and the chemical control, etc. But currently, do you agree that the pyramid basically looks like that at the moment, that, that that's, that's somehow standing on its, on its own peak? I do, unfortunately, think as an industry, if we take the whole, I don't think we get a great grade for IPM as a whole. Mm. We talk about it, we brag about it, yep. but you know, in some cases it's, you know, and in some cases it's customer driven. Again, there'll be some people right. like, where is the spray? Where is the black right. boxes with the poison yes. baits? Yes. Don't give me a lecture on cleaning up or plugging holes. Your job is to get rid of these pests and do it. 
And it's a rock and a hard place, as the saying goes, for our it industry. Is. It mm -hmm. is. Yeah, 100% agreed. You said uh, uh, we, we uh, uh, get an F for how we treat our own nest as we humans. Uh, um, maybe you can explain what you meant with that when we talked about garbage, uh, especially in, uh, in, in NYC and other big areas like that. Yes, you know, I, I think in general, if you look around, you know, and again, there's exceptions to everything. And there's some cities in the world that are get an A for yeah for the way they maintain their nest in their cities. Mm -hmm. And as I do surveys around the world, I see big differences in cities. You know, in the US to some degree, where we have high density cities with maybe stretched budgets mm -hmm. for these city governments, um, it's a conundrum, it's difficult. And it's easy to say we need to do a better job. Yeah. But there are so many factors yeah, that I play agree. into this, including Even sometimes I talk about IPM for the city and they'll say the union will not agree to that. Mm. Of all things, you don't see the word union in IPM, right? The union management or the union employment or the benefits and those things do not show up. I tried to get New York City, for example, to change litter baskets from one style to another that would deny rats, which could easily be done. But they said, no, you know, our workers do not like the basket you advise, and we're not switching. So we continue to feed rats through our litter baskets. Hmm. I think New York City is probably the biggest playground on IPM, garbage management, and all of that, right? I, it's got to be one of, the, one of the tops, you know. It's got to be, you know. So somebody should do a study on, on that question. <laughs> so speaking about monitoring again, um, I know that there is – I, in my opinion, uh, many people that have broad knowledge on uh, chemicals, um, on pesticides, on rodenticides, on insecticides, and there is all sorts of innovations um, and new products, highly interesting new products uh, coming out every year. Um, but monitoring, you're right, it's actually underappreciated maybe to a, to a certain degree. Um, so, so how could one monitor except from the obvious that one visits the site and does a, a thorough inspection? Well, there's certainly nothing wrong with the, um, I'll use the term, the old-fashioned way of monitoring. Absolutely. If you wanted to do that, you could. But new technology, as, as you're alluding to, is really showing us that monitoring is going to have its day in a yeah. big way. And so now there's remote sensors, as we all are familiar with. Mm -hmm. And even the remote sensing technology You know, which has actually been out to some degree. It was born, you know, years ago, but it's finally beginning to catch on. It is. Right? And, and so um, to me as a consultant in the food industry, in the warehousing industry, and, and for big airports and so forth, um, I insist my customers employ monitoring using technology. Mm -hmm. and database they, you know they have to have good database management and where they have powerful database where they can connect the remote sensors to the database management mm -hmm. because i think it is our obligation if we agree to take on say a big project for an airport or a shopping mall or or whatever have you It's our obligation not to just treat for pests, but to profile the population of pests in that mm. client's facility so we can prove, quite honestly, if it's a court of law, how are we doing? Uh, have you reduced the pest population by 30%, 62%? Yeah. Have you not reduced the pest population? And if not, why not? The only way we can do those and answer those questions is through monitoring. And technology now is enabling us. Mm. to do that. Mm. Now, the old-fashioned way would take, you could do it, but it would be a lot of labor. You know, if you had to get up in ceilings, I'll use that one as an easy example. Easy. If there's rats in a ceiling and there's 500 rats in a big shopping mall, that's going to be a lot of labor up and down mm -hmm. ladders if you yes. did it the old-fashioned way. So technology is going to enable us to do it just by looking at our iPhones or our smartphones. Exactly. I don't know if you've seen the interview, but I interviewed Håkan Kjellberg, who is the technical uh, um, manager of Antisimex, one of, uh, um, I think, 
the world's third largest pest control company. And Hocken said um, they have their own smart, um, they call it smart system with uh, digital senses and technologies and traps. And Hocken said um, that uh, we are going from knowing Oh, from guessing to knowing, uh, which he thought was the biggest argument for going towards digital solutions as a helping hand. And this is also, I, I would like your comment on, on Hawkins, um quote there. And also I would like your opinion on whether a lot of technicians um, or, you know, mid-management um, people in our industry fear that digital senses are going to maybe not only change their work, their daily work as a technical person, um, as a pest manager, but also take away their jobs, make it redundant to a certain degree, um, which I have a, a lot of counter arguments, of course, for, because I think it's, it's just, it's definitely going to change, but it's not going to take away their jobs. But I would like your comment on this rather long questions on, 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 on the quote of Hawkan uh, from uh, guessing to knowing and on the perspective of pest management. Well, I, I agree 100% with Hawkins, you know, comment. It's beautifully stated, to be honest with you. It's very succinct, you know, from guessing to knowing, it, that's it, you know. Um, you know, we use the word in our industry that we always a little bit hide behind, to be honest. Yeah. We estimate, well, in my, we've estimated your population to be low, medium, or high. Yeah. And again, where does that leave? Yeah. a customer as well is it low is it what do you mean medium it, it's a medium pest yeah. infestation so you know i think using words like estimates and also words like we're controlling your population you know that gives us too much wiggle room well what does control mean exactly. you know did, if you if you kill three german cockroaches did you control them mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe not, depending on the size of the population. So one thing leads to another as to that whole business of guessing and knowing. Yeah. And if we shift correctly, and it's going so fast, as you know, um, if we shift correctly and embrace all this technology and the power of it, we are going to know. And then it's going to be our job to make sure we transfer that accurately by being able to read databases Yes. Um, to the client and that brings in the technician and there is concern I hear many technicians they express that same thing as well maybe I won't have a job in two years and you know I said remote technology does not threaten your job at all in my opinion no one's going to be replacing the technician because yeah. you must have the human element here and a human interpretation mm -hmm. remote sensors can't interpret for yeah. us True. they only can state the situation they only can give us you know how many you know mice were in the school kitchen you know how many rats were were in the ceiling but it's our job as pest professionals to interpret that use it to the best advantage and then say to a customer remote technology has told me that the nursing walls let's just say for these rodents are in the southwest corner of your warehouse and now that we know that, we are going to focus on those nesting zones. That's going to be up to the technician to be trained, to use the technology, to interpret the technology, and act upon that technology. We will never replace technicians with remote technology. Thank you very much, because I think so too. And, and you know, um, you and I were both really, really passionate about pest management and our, our peers uh, all around the world that we uh, share that passion with. And um, for me, always, I, of course, I, I'm a strong believer that uh, of your thesis, um, that your thesis is true, that digital is going to help us to do a better job and get more data to be able to act better in pest management, more sustainable. I always had the thesis that um, we get another intelligent tool and it's just uh, on us how we use it and interact with it and interpret it, as you said. And also, I think it could help, and I would like your comment on that as well, it could help on uplifting or elevating the role of a pest te uh, management technician because we, we, uh, we have, and I don't know if you have the same saying in, in the US, but in Europe, we sometimes disgraceful call it uh, bait box jockeys or, you know, bait box checkers or whatnot, which is obviously a rather easy to do job. And I, my mission is really to give them better tools and to uplift or elevate the status of a pest manager manager towards a consultant of the food industry or whatever clients you have, be it a 
a, a shop, be it a, a bar, a restaurant, a hotel, a food or pharma company? Do you also think it could help to uplift the level and the perception of a pest management, uh, pest, pest management, uh, um, PMP as you call it in the US uh, uh, worldwide? I think it's a critical question. And the reason I do, Danielle, is because we have a very high turnover. I don't know how it is in Europe, but here in the United States, we have a very high turnover of our pest management technicians. Mm -hmm. The better companies, of course, that have you know, good uh, programs and have vision and inspire yeah. the technicians and pay them well, mm -hmm. they have low turnover. Yeah. But part of that turnover problem is we hire really quality people that at first are very excited about the opportunity to work with animals and uh, pest populations and biology. Yeah. And then sometimes we put them out on important accounts, very important accounts, like yeah. pharmaceutical yeah. accounts, food plant yeah. accounts, yeah. warehouses, hotels. And we say, your job is to service 300 bait stations this week. Well, Having done that myself is, you know, day after day, up and down with a key, opening up black boxes, 75% of which, if not greater, have yes. never been visited. What did we just hire? We, that could be automated, quite frankly, if we wanted to. But that person saying, what, what am I doing? I'm, I'm checking black boxes one after the other, day in, day out, month after month, because this is a very important account for my yes. boss. Yes. But in the end, I am nothing more than, as you just stated, an equipment checker, mm -hmm. which anybody could do. You could go into that building and get the building custodian and say, let me show you how to do this, and you could do it now yourself. Yes. So your point is, Tremendous because when I talk to technicians that I have somewhat coached or even sent them to the industry from university, they say to me, Bobby, you know, after a year, I, I was completely bored. And that job was not a job for a biologist graduate. It was a job for anybody that could do it. So, mm -hmm. and they quit. They quit. They're like, I'm bored with this. Mm -hmm. And who cannot understand them? And I think in, in the current, uh, in the 2020s, uh, you know, Generation Y and Z, um, generations that grew up without any hard times, basically, but with, I think, first world problems, they are looking for a purpose in their job. They're um, evaluating whether the company they work for um, offers them a purpose in the, in the stuff they do. And I think um, giving them insightful, insightful uh, intelligent tools and a purpose uh, to service these accounts within a sustainable means and IPM makes it more meaningful, if, if you ask me. What, what do you think? I, I, yes, definitely meaningful is, is the key word there because, you know, um, everybody, for the most part, you know, wants to be a bit inspired by their work as well as rewarded for their work, right? Mm -hmm. You want to get up in the morning and look yeah. forward to some degree, to what you're about to do that day. Mm. Otherwise, you're, you may do it for a certain amount of period of time to bridge a gap for your pay or something, but you want something that is going to inspire you. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how I see it is like, oh boy, you know, I've, I may find an answer to what I've been thinking about this week on yeah. why the rodents behave the way they do. You know, we have that completely within our power, within each company, to inspire the technicians that go out on a job. You know, I use an expression by the famous E.O. Wilson, you know, the famous, famous naturalist who says, you know, to the lazy hunter, the woods are always empty. <laughs> And we are, we are hunters to some degree as to where are the pest populations? Why are they there? How are they getting in? And how can we fix it? Can we fix it? And if not, how do we intervene? There's a lot on the plate from inspiring and making something meaningful, but it starts with every single company. And for every company's manager, I would ask, how do you inspire your technicians versus just giving them a route and telling them, get it done and don't have callbacks? Great argument, Bobby. Couldn't agree more, really. Um, so I think that's definitely 
and really interesting task for the big organizations, but also the mid-size, you know, the, uh, the small mid-size enterprises of the world to give people a process and a meaningful approach in pest management, which in the end uh, would reflect in a better um, pest management overall. So I think we're in exciting times. And speaking about exciting times, I would like your take on uh, obviously the future, the next five, 10, 20 years of pest management maybe. Uh, we talked a lot about digital sensors and obviously there are various forms that are available in the markets even today. How do you see the technology um, developing within the next couple of years and how, why did it not yet scale into pest management? Why is not yet every single box digital box already with a small sensor camera or whatever um, already when we have uh, things like that, uh, an iPhone or, a, or stuff that's incredibly intelligent and, and, and performant. So what is the barrier? Uh, you know, I often ask myself that question is because I'm a person when I see something makes sense. I'm like, now, let's do it now. Let's go. Crazy, yeah. yeah. Um, and you know, I, I think, you know, the industry has been in a particular mode of operation for a couple hundred years. And when you, you have a model that not only is the industry in that mode, but the customer base expects that mode. And all of a sudden, technology has caught up and is beginning to surpass the old mode. You know, you're going to have this change. You're going to have this next wave. And especially with pest control, because I think so many people are a little bit, you know, dubious as to what are you doing and does it work? Because... Yeah. You know, we've had people that say I've had three pest control companies and the first two, I don't know what they did, but it didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. And so we have a little bit more of a disadvantage of customers asking us to embrace new technology. You know, they don't understand pests well enough. You and I do, and perhaps many of sitting in on this, this meeting later will. However, I think we are waiting for a tipping point, yes. if you're familiar with that concept. And yes. right now, I even have a hard time getting some food plants, which they are all about food safety, and they're very good food plants, but they're still very cautious and hesitant to embrace the remote technology as an example. Mm -hmm. And I, even though I'm urging them, trust me, this is the smartest thing we could do. Mm -hmm. um, they are worried about auditors. They are worried about government inspectors. They haven't used it enough to feel where they're comfortable. So it's going to take time, you know, which is frustrating. But I think yeah. we are going to hit a tipping point. Yes. And I think there will be a revolution, you know, in the pest management industry the same way, you know, probably a little bit longer. But remember the revolution when we switched from spraying for cockroaches yeah. to baiting for cockroaches. Yes. That was a game changer. Yeah. We, we went to baits for termites. Who yeah. would have thunk? Yeah. I think this is in the same realm, mm -hmm. but because it's not a treatment, mm -hmm. it's having its day in terms of a little bit of a lag. But I have every confidence, having worked with it so much, that it is going to go forth and be globally embraced. I think so too, and I couldn't agree more, really, Bobby. Um, one thing I was, I was really, uh, uh, what, you know, the definition of a tipping point for me is a comparison to popcorn. You remember when, we, when you do popcorn in, in the kitchen, it goes like pop, yes. pop, and then suddenly it goes pop, 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 and that's kind of the tipping point. And one of my last interviewees was Tony O'Donovan, who is head of pest control global of uh, Tesco, who's um, Tesco is one of the biggest supermarkets, I think, in Europe. And they probably also have uh, some stores in, in Asia and I don't know if in the US, but uh, um, I think over 10,000 of, of uh, stores. Uh, so quite a big um, uh, shopkeeper, as he calls himself. And uh, Tony said and launched within our um, podcast or in our video interviews here that they've just signed the biggest, probably the biggest pest control, uh, digital pest control contract in the world, which um, he uh, was responsible for and which he made to go in over 4,000 sites with probably over 30, 35,000 digital devices. Um, in the UK starting now, um, which to me was 
it felt like a tipping point. And I said, Tony, wow, uh, you really got to be proud of what you just achieved with your, for Tesco there. Because I think all the other supermarket chains, I mean, you name them, and you have uh, uh, even bigger ones in the US, Walmart, etc. Uh, so um, uh, do you think that could be kind of a tipping point? Is that a certain number we needed to make things work quicker? Yeah, I, I think the Tesco example is, is going to be for sure one of the forces that push this towards the tipping point. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because of course, everybody looks to give me example. It, if I say to one of my clients, you know, you need to install 65 sensors mm -hmm. into this pharmaceutical plant, mm -hmm. they're going to be hesitant unless I show them there's another pharmaceutical plant or something similar. It could be a supermarket chain like Tesco or Walmart or somebody. They want to see, like, is this dependable? Can I talk to someone? Has it stood the test of time for audits and government yep. scrutiny? And yes. so by having a Tesco start this it, to that magnitude um, and willing to share that knowledge, perhaps at conventions, the, the pest, you know, expos and so forth, mm -hmm. that is going to push this in a significant exactly. way because it is a very identifiable established entity that everybody can relate to. Oh yeah, I know Tesco, of course. And if Tesco said it's really helped them, you know, um, I'm on board. So, you know, now where's the tipping point for me is, uh, you know, I would like to see it common speak when, when I speak to someone, I can say, which remote technology are you using before you hire me as a consultant and they would already have an answer saying we've been using this for two years now that for me is a tipping point i agree yeah and i think it's also a race of technologies it's it's you know basically like back in the days uh, samsung apple nokia etc et i mean the iphone was launched i think 2006 and uh, it took a while to be accepted by the uh, broader um world uh, i think I don't know, at least like uh, almost uh, up to 10 years before everybody had a, had a smartphone. So I think there's definitely an adaption phase for smart digital sensors and pest control as well. Um, and I agree with you that there is many, many forms um, that drive that acceptance. You know, clients that ask for a certain type of service that also have play a vital role in influencing how we manage pests. But also, as you said, the government with laws and standards like American Institute of Baking being one. Um, so um, I don't know, maybe you can comment or have a, like an outlook or a, um, I don't know, an assumption on, on how the US is going to react within the next five years. I know that in Europe there are discussions of um, maybe adapting the law towards application of rodenticides to demand more IPM per law before it, um, you know, chemicals or physical control uh, can be applied. And also, do you have some sort of idea where the standards are heading? Because I know that uh, from uh, the AIB especially, that digital trapping for the past five years was accepted broadly. And even the head of uh, AIB Europe, um, Richard Britton, uh, um, uh, said that uh, um, it's it's assigned. I think uh, um, digital sensors are assigned uh, for AIB and are positive to be used in an audit. Uh, so, are there any signs from your end that you have uh, surveyed in the market from, uh, let's say, law standards? You know, that's one of the areas that I think is lagging a little bit behind. Although, I think. The laws and the FDA here in the U.S. and the USDA and yeah. the whole supply chain, Daniel, I think they are receptive because they can read up on themselves and they see that it is a digital world. So there's receptivity to this. There's also now, if you've been watching since you mentioned auditors, for example, um, I, I don't, I've been doing surveys and audits my consulting audits on food and pharma for a long time. Mm -hmm. And there's about eight major auditing groups here in the U.S., and many of them same for Europe. And seven of those eight now use terminology where equipment and inspections of that equipment and using technology for that equipment is assessment-based instead of they used to all put out guidelines as to how much equipment 
what would be the spacing for that equipment and so forth. And none of which, all that spacing, let's just say every 10 meters, you're going to have a bait box around a warehouse mm -hmm. and you will check it once or twice a month. None yeah. of that was based on science, not a single yeah. bit of it. And I actually traced that back in graduate schools. Where did those rules come from? Yeah. They did the best they could in the 40s, believe it or not, with estimating the home ranges of rodents and how they travel. And he said, well, let's just put a bait box in every home range of a rat, which is maybe 50, 200 feet. Yeah. But we now know, in fact, I just finished working on a paper with Cornell. We've proven that um, rodents don't behave, for example, around buildings in linear fashion. They mm -hmm. behave in clumped distribution fashion. It's the job of the pest professionals using technology, if you will, coming, and their knowledge to put equipment where it will intercept these pests. Yes. That is going to be a total game changer. I think mm -hmm. that we will see that equipment may look crazy in the future. One side of a warehouse has 40 pieces of equipment, another side has three. That's the way animals behave and remote technology for my pilots with it and working with it has already begun to prove that is true. So that's where I think it's going is sooner or later when we do hit this global tipping point in technology plus experience plus dedication and all those great factors, Pest control is going to look radically different. The same way a termite job looks radically different against subterranean termites. It's radically different. It's not slightly different. That's where we're going. Yeah. I would love to revisit that topic, especially on digital sensors every, I don't know, like six, 12 months from here on, because I also think the tipping point has been reached. Now it's a race of, in my honest opinion, the technology drivers of the world, people that make Internet of Things smart, uh, whatever you want to call it, traps. But I want to close with, with uh, something I always remembered you saying from a talk that you gave at MPMA some years back where you said uh, pest controllers need to be detectives and need to survey things like a detective and be curious. And I really love that because in the end, if you ask me, let's say 10, 20 years from today, 2040 maybe, uh, if I look back on my career, I think pest management itself did not change. And your quote there did not change at all. We are just using different tools, aren't we? Yes, I would agree with that comment. You know, it's, it's funny you mention that as we wrap up because right now, this morning before I um, got online with you, I'm working on an article for pest control technology and the title of that article is We Are Observational Biologists. <laughs> and, if, and the whole business of going back to that talk where I mentioned detective work is we are being paid to observe live animals, whether yeah. they are ants, birds, you name the pest group. If we are not biologists and we're careful about our observations, what are we? What's our definition? How would we like to get up every day and say, please define what you do? And I would say, you're paying me to be an observational biologist. You don't have to have a degree in it, but you better have experience mm -hmm. and you better be able to use everything that comes with that. So that for me, That's where it's going. <laughs> Love it. Look forward to the article on PCT. Thank Bobby, you. thank you so much for the interview. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. It was an honor to be asked to address talk management. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. And look forward to the next one, revisiting these topics with you in around six months or something. Okay. Stay safe in Germany, okay? You too.